It's a delight to be here with you, to, to be with people, kindred spirits who uh, uh, are concerned uh, and interested in preserving and protecting wild salmon, because that's exactly why the Numkees First Nation uh, embarked upon uh, Kutera, this project. The Numkees are uh, located in Alert Bay on northern Vancouver Island. Uh, salmon are at the heart of their culture. Here they are on their annual uh, walk for wild salmon. And uh, they live next to the Broughton Archipelago, which is a collection of an amazing group of islands, but it also has the highest concentration of uh, Atlantic salmon fish farms in Canada, more than 25 fish farms on their doorstep. And they're concerned about the impacts of those farms. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with some of the, the uh, concerns that scientists have documented, be it uh, the amplification or the growth of sea lice in these uh, net pens, uh, the entanglement and drowning of marine mammals, and as well the exchange of uh, potential disease exchange from farm fish to wild fish, as well as the, uh, the wastes uh, that uh, just uh, fall from the, uh, the farms into the marine environment. So many others share these concerns. Uh, one of them uh, was an individual by the name of Eric Hobson who founded the uh, Save Our Salmon or SOS Marine Conservation Foundation. So Eric gathered a bunch of like-minded individuals. He's an engineer and an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. So he grabbed, uh, pulled together a bunch of people, called his Solutions Advisory Committee. And they had a multi-pronged strategy. One was to do scientific research to do with uh, uh, fish farms. Another was to launch a court case with First Nations. And the third strategy, they came up with this idea of doing it better. Why not come up with a better way of, of farming salmon, one way that we can protect the environment while at the same time create a new industry, build jobs uh, for our province. So then Tides Canada stepped up as one of the lead funders. They've contributed more than $3 million to the project. Sustainable Development Technology Canada has contributed more than $4 million. And the Numkees are actually sort of the lead funders in the sense that they've put up uh, $4.5 million of their own money as well as loan guarantees to uh, move the project forward. Tides Canada also paid for staff from the Conservation Fund's Freshwater Institute in West Virginia. These are uh, a group of, of world-leading RAS experts, RAS meaning recirculating aquaculture system uh, technology. Uh, they sit on our technical advisory uh, committee. And then we have Albion Fisheries, located here in Vancouver, who are our uh, processors and distributors of the fish. Uh, the role of the Pacific Salmon Foundation is to be the independent environmental monitors. We didn't want to end up creating more problems than we'd, we'd started out to solve. So right from day one, uh, professional biologist Michael Berry from Alert Bay has been watching us closely. Uh, he provides regular reports both to Terry and the Foundation as well as directly to our board. Right now, once or since we put fish in the facility, his main focus is fish health and what comes out the tailpipe, the effluent. Uh, which he monitors uh, closely. The overarching goal is to catalyze a change from open net pen fish farming to moving those pens and those fish onto land. Uh, as part of that process, number one, we had to do some myth busting. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we really needed to prove the technical, the biological, and the economic feasibility of growing these fish on land. Ultimately, they want to create jobs and make a profit and, uh, and also become a model of sustainable uh, growth or a model of sustainability. Ultimately, we want to use the waste, the solid waste and the liquid waste coming from the facility to create additional or ancillary revenue streams to utilize that to create value-added products. We talked about the problem. You know what that is? The solution we're proposing is a recirculating aquaculture system, RAS technology. And the way our system works is the water uh, coming into the facility comes from a groundwater well because we're close to the ocean. It's slightly salty. Uh, we disinfect that water using ultraviolet light. The important thing in these systems is to keep the pathogens, the bugs, out so you keep your fish healthy. So the water goes into the, uh, into the tank where the fish are. They swim, they eat, they poop. And we take the solid waste out using uh, drum filters with fine mesh. So uh, currently, uh, those solid wastes go off to be composted. Uh, liquid waste uh, currently goes to a dry infiltration basin, percolates back down to the groundwater. Our long-term goal is to utilize the nutrient-laden uh, water 
for growing uh, vegetables or algae that could be used uh, as an input to fish feed. So the fish, as they're doing their thing, uh, metabolizing their feed, they, they create uh, ammonia, they give off CO2. So we take the water from the tank and we put it into a biological filter or a biofilter. So we're actually growing two things in this facility. We're growing fish and bacteria in a symbiotic relationship. They each need each other. So the bacteria, they eat the ammonia, they clean the water, and then we strip out the CO2 and we inject oxygen and ozone back into that cleaned water before it goes back to the fish. So we utilize, uh, we reuse more than 99% of that water. It's reused and recycled. Uh, so that concept uh, has come to life in the form of, of this building uh, that houses the facility. When it's optimized, it should produce about 400 metric tons of salmon uh, annually. Just to give you a sense of how it all works, well, the smolts arrive in a, in a couple of big trucks and uh, they're pumped into the quarantine tank. And here's Chief Bill Cranmer uh, on hand when the first uh, smolts arrived. Uh, the quarantine unit uh, is important. It's got its own water system. It's got its own biofilter because, again, we want to, well, our biggest risk is the introduction of disease. So even though these smolts are certified disease-free by a vet, we keep them in this biosecure area for four months before we transfer them to the grow-out area. So the way the fish move through uh, the facility is uh, they come into the quarantine tank, as I say, for about four months. Then they're moved, they're pumped into the grow-out facility, and they're graded. Big fish into one tank, small fish into another. And they stay in that tank uh, for the rest of their lives, about eight or nine months before we start harvesting them every 10 days. So every 10 days, we harvest some fish from, from one of the grow-out tanks into our finishing tank or our depuration uh, tank. So we don't feed the fish in that tank. They've got clean water that hasn't recirculated through the system and, and they're not fed, so they're purged. And when they taste perfect, then we harvest them and uh, they head down the highway uh, to Albion. Now what you see when you go into the facility is we've got a biofilter over here. This is our CO2 stripper. These are the rotating drum filters with the fine mesh to take out the solid wastes. Here's a big grow out tank, smaller purge tank, uh, finishing tank is just behind it. You can see a big uh, fish pump here. That's how we move the fish uh, from tank to tank. So back in action, here they are uh, pumping the fish from the quarantine into one of the uh, grow out tanks. And then here's the, uh, the fish in the purge tank. You can see how uh, clear the water is. So they're there for about seven days, as I say, before we uh, pump them out and, and they shoot out, they shoot up and then out across this table where they're directed into what's called a stun and bleed machine. So they're directed head first and then a pneumatic hammer comes down and bonks them on the head and, and their gills are slit and they slip straight into a, an ice and water filled slurry mix in a tote. And that tote that our team is sitting on here, uh, these blue totes uh, head off on a truck down to uh, Albion Fisheries uh, here in Richmond. And uh, so the fish here are being gutted, but most of the fish are filleted and uh, they uh, Safeway is our exclusive retail, uh, retailer for selling Kutera salmon. So if you haven't tasted Kutera salmon yet, I encourage you to head over to your Safeway seafood counter and you'll find it there. Um, that's the only place you'll find it. So that's the process of, of the fish and uh, the progress of the project. This slide is just to give you a, a, a broader perspective of where we're at in things. So back in 2012, we started construction. And then in March 2013, we brought the first smolts into the quarantine facility, but we hadn't finished building the grow out yet. So we continued to build around this uh, first cohort of fish. We call them our commissioning cohort, part guinea pig, part fish. And that's when we began the commissioning and discovery stage. As was mentioned, this is the first facility, commercial scale facility, that was specifically designed and built to grow Atlantic salmon to market size. So it's been done for broodstock purposes for the industry for years, 
but not to, to, uh, to make a, a business out of it. So there are a lot of production factors that, that we had to wrestle with, that uh, lots of learning. So our first harvest was almost a year ago. It was Earth Day, actually, uh, April 22nd, 2013. We put our first fish out to the market. And uh, we, we're ramping up the capacity or the stock of the fish. The first batch we brought in cohort was 23,000 fish. And we brought in 33,000. Then we brought in 40,000. And we bring them in every four months, so three times a year. So in a couple of months, we should be hitting steady state uh, in terms of full biomass. And then next year, we should hit uh, break even. Back to our original goals, I mentioned earlier, myth busting was one of them. So one of the myths we heard, apart from it's just impossible, oh, this is interesting, uh, well, land. Uh, the first myth was it would just take way too much land. So we've been able to show that you could take the entire BC Atlantic salmon farming industry and in facilities like ours, you could put them in a space that's less than half the size of Stanley Park. So that myth was definitely busted. Uh, here, another myth was that it would just use way too much water. Well, we run a wild salmon hatchery, the Numki Stew, on the Nimkish River, not far from Kutera. And when all of its pumps are going, it's a, what's called a flow-through hatchery. The water comes out of the groundwater well, through the raceways, and then back into the river. When it's using all of its pumps, it uses 60 times more water than, our facil than Kutera's facility does. And we produce way more biomass. So we use about 500 liters per minute uh, right now. So very little water is used in our facility. This is the, as I mentioned, a dry infiltration basin. The water percolates down through the sand and gravel, goes back to the groundwater. Uh, the third myth was that it's going to cost way too much for electricity to run this thing. Right? Well, we spend a lot of time and money uh, designing and building uh, as many energy efficient components as we could, or elements. So here we are receiving uh, a check from BC Power Smart program. Power is not even one of our top three costs, so we're very pleased with that. So, so thankfully that, that myth is gone. And lastly, concern over fish husbandry. Well, the, the Freshwater Institute in West Virginia, they've done about half a dozen or more trials growing Atlantic salmon at much greater densities that we are growing them. And they've specifically tested those fish for cortisone, for other uh, stress indicators, you know, as well as their physical um, condition. They haven't found any issues with it. Atlantic salmon are a schooling fish. But the other thing is that within these facilities, we're creating, we have the ability to create the optimal conditions for the fish. Optimal temperature, optimal oxygen levels, salinity, alkalinity. And so basically, you've got stress-free fish. And uh, that makes all the difference. The other goals, uh, you know, technical, biological, proving the economic feasibility. Let's look at the economic side first. Um, some of the organizations that are very concerned with the, uh, the impacts of open net pen fish farming, uh, one of them is the Monterey Bay Aquarium, their uh, seafood watch program. They've developed a set of criteria to assess the sustainability either of the wild capture fishery or the uh, farming industry and, and facility. And so they've got a green, yellow, red system. Uh, green being best choice, yellow, good alternative, red being avoid. It is not sustainably produced. Well, 99% of the Atlantic salmon uh, produced uh, in open net pen farms maybe 99.9% .9 is uh, rated red, avoid. The only green best choice producers are uh, three RAS producers, Kutera, and there's a farm in Denmark, and then the Freshwater Institute with their experimental tanks uh, in the United States. So we were very pleased to receive this uh, ranking in the fall. Uh, it really validated the work that's been done to date on trying to come up with a better way to, uh, to farm these fish. And organizations like Monterey Bay have been putting pressure on retailers like Safeway, Loblaw, Sobeys, Walmart to purchase their fish from sustainable suppliers. So that has created an opportunity for us. We know that North Americans eat more than 750 million pounds of Atlantic salmon a year. And uh, Albion tells us on the West Coast, the I-5 corridor alone, they estimate that there's a market for more than 100 million pounds of sustainably produced uh, salmon a year. 
Right now, there's maybe 4 million pounds a year of sustainable supply to that market. So these companies, like Safeways, have made a commitment by a certain time for Safeways by the end of 2015 to source their, their fish from sustainable producers. So that's where our opportunity lies. One of the major assumptions that we had in our business plan was that we thought we would be able to get a significant premium for this product. And thankfully, that has been borne out. Uh, it's not just because this product is sustainably produced, but there's no antibiotics, there's no pesticides. Uh, obviously, it's very healthy, high in omega-3s. But uh, those are distinguishing characteristics that have enabled us to get a premium price that's 30 to 40% higher than, uh, than typical commodity uh, price for Atlantic salmon. To talk a little bit about the fish themselves, how are the fish doing? This slide, uh, we, you know, we have a set of key performance indicators or a dashboard that we track. Mortality is one of them. So the mortality level of the first cohort was 25%. You know, we thought that was really bad, and then the CEO of Marine Harvest said to me, he said, geez, I thought you guys were gonna kill the first couple of batches of fish, right? So uh, I took that as a compliment. Uh, they know how hard it is to, uh, to grow fish. But uh, second cohort brought it down to about 10%, and that's very close to our break-even target. The fifth cohort, down here, it's tracking very much like the second cohort. What happened with the second cohort is our, we had biofilter issues that, that we didn't get resolved until this last December, and so we had very murky water for about three weeks, and you can see that created quite a mortality event here. That's now behind us. We've got really crystal clear water, so we're anticipating that this trend line will, will get us where we want to be. So we think mortality is behind us now. In terms of feed conversion, feed conversion is the efficiency that the fish uh, convert feed into flesh. So in this case, with our first cohort, it took 1.25 kilograms of feed to grow one kilogram of fish. Um, with the second cohort, we, that was reduced to about 1.1 kilograms of feed to one kilogram of fish. And you can see that subsequent cohorts are, are uh, significantly lower in, in their respective places, uh, you know, state of the life cycle. So we're encouraged there as well. We should be able to do 1.1, 1 uh, sorry, 1.121. In fact, we should be able to do 0 0.9 to 1. Uh, that's our ultimate target. So we're headed in the right direction with, uh, with that. Growth, well, the first cohort is this blue line, and you can see it's all over the map. Uh, those fish, well, we didn't turn on the heating system until they'd been in the, in the facility for eight months. So they, they were subjected to varied uh, challenging uh, and changing uh, growth rearing conditions. Uh, the second cohort you can see is much more stable or, or a straight line because they had much better, more stable rearing conditions. And the third cohort, uh, again, continuing improving water quality and consistency, uh, they're significantly better again. So the trend lines are headed in the right direction. Challenges remain though. Um, Number one, we have to finish uh, commissioning. We've got uh, maybe another six weeks. We'll see us uh, through the bulk of the changes, uh, some new technology uh, we're putting into the tanks. Um, and we'll, we'll be wrapped up with all of that stuff within the next few months. Then early maturation. So at a certain point in their life cycle, these fish decide whether they're going to mature or not. When they start to sexually mature, several things happen. They stop growing. They start putting all of their energy into developing their reproductive system. So that's not good for feed conversion. Also, uh, their color changes. They start to get darker. Uh, the males, you know, they develop a kipe, uh, so the shape changes. The females, the color from their flesh starts going into their roe, so the fish becomes more pale. So it's not as high value a fish. We don't sell it as a Kutera premium fish any longer, and that hurts our bottom line. So. Uh, we're working with people around the world, scientists, other producers, to, uh, to reduce the early maturation of these fish. We have a number of levers uh, that we can manipulate. Temperature, uh, light, the amount of photo period or light that the fish get. Uh, the salinity uh, can impact them. The strain of the fish makes a difference. So we're working on all of, all of those fronts to, uh, to sort of crack that nut. 
the last issue, again, a, a biological one, is just as we finish dealing with all of the commissioning in, uh, issues and sort of taming the technology, then we can really focus on growing the fish better and faster. And that's where our attention uh, will be turning. The next step for us uh, is to build a hatchery because uh, right now we buy our smolts from the, the, uh, the open net pen industry and uh, we're the tail, they're the dog. They produce their fish for when they need them for their net pens. Ideally, to optimize this facility, we would have fish, smolts going in every four months, right? And it would also greatly reduce the, uh, the risk of disease introduction and we could dial the smolts right into our growing conditions right from day one. So that's, that's our next step. Uh, and at the same time we do that would be to build a second module and increase our production from 400 tons to 1,500. Um, these businesses are best done at scale. You know, we're a small pilot facility. Uh, so 1,500 tons would, would give us a great deal or, of uh, economies of scale would really help our cost structure and it would would really send the message to government to industry to all who are watching that uh, this technology uh, does work and is a viable alternative and lastly when we when we build a second module we're going to build a separate uh, finishing tanks two finishing tanks uh, because the market ideally wants fish every week right and one of our competitive advantages is we control that fish from every step of its life cycle right through to when it goes into that toad, right? So we, we would be able to really perfect the harvesting process, have a totally relaxed harvesting process because it really increases the quality of the fish. And uh, that's one of our goals. Everybody's watching uh, and we know that, we feel it. There's a lot of, uh, it certainly gets us out of bed in the morning. Uh, to do our best. Uh, a lot is riding on Kutera's success and uh, we just appreciate the support that we've received from so many different fronts to, uh, to make this project happen and uh, to get us across the finish line. So uh, I want to thank once again uh, Terry for his ongoing support and the role of the Pacific Salmon Foundation uh, as the independent environmental monitors and thank you for your interest uh, in Kutera. Thank you.